esteemed colleagues, dear students, good afternoon. I would like to begin by expressing my deep gratitude to the Divinity School of Chungchi College, the Center for Christian Studies and the Center for Catholic Studies, along with their diligent directors, Professors Francis Yip, Colton Yam, Ansem Lam, for this very honorable invitation. It is also a pleasure to meet the colleagues and the students of the Holy Spirit Seminary, Professor uh, Erika Lee in particular, tasked with formulating the difficult task of formulating a response to my undoubtedly enigmatic lecture. Um, heartful thanks also for the kind introduction by Professor Simon Kwan and Ansam Lam, and also Professor uh, Colton Yam, thank you for your bi biographical introduction, not conductive to my humility. Uh, Augustine of Hippo would rightly remind me that everything is a gift of God's grace. In particular today, I would like to thank Dr. Colton Yam. Devoted to the academic exploration of patristic theology and Augustinian erudition, committed to the dissemination of early Christian charism. He is a passionate researcher, an inspiring teacher, a humble family man, an exemplary Christian, and yes, a cherished friend, a true gift of grace. Finally, I extend my thanks to all of you. In one of his earliest reflections, the Soliloquia, Augustine observed that truth and happiness can never be found in isolation, but only in the company of others. By gathering today with Augustine, we embark on a shared pilgrimage toward that truth and happiness. And Augustine himself understood his life as a journey toward the eternal city, a pilgrimage in which he serves as a seasoned guide for the Christian community. Hence, the title of my lecture, which exists, consists of two parts. In the first part, we delve into the biographical trajectory of his own pilgrimage and the enduring impact of his ideas. And in the second, more extensive part after the break, we examine his ecclesiology, his understanding of the church and the life of the Christian community, culminating in his insightful vision of the church as a pilgrim community. As you will notice during my lecture, I will also show examples of Augustan iconography. Not only philosophers and theologians, but also artists have reflected on Augustan's life and thought and this from their own historical and cultural context. In this, we will observe how in each era Augustine was understood differently, and we will get a better sense of the various possible perspectives on his thinking. And we start here with the oldest depiction of Augustine, a sixth century fresco, which could be based on an original portrait of Augustine. In the first part, we will briefly review Augustine's dramatic biography, his extensive bibliography, and the various domains where his influence today can be discerned. A restless biography. Why showing this Algerian postage stamp and this painting of Monica, Augustine's mother? Well, it's because Augustine, with his Roman education, was actually North African, born on 13 November 354 at Tagaste, present-day Souk Aras, living in the region we now know as Algeria and Tunisia. Furthermore, his mother hailed from a Berber background. Augustine thus was Roman by culture and North African from origin. 
Augustine studied rhetoric, eloquence, and later became a teacher in this discipline, successively first in his hometown Tagaste, later in Carthage, the capital of the African province, in Rome, and finally in Milan, the capital of the imperial court. Augustine's quest for truth consumed his entire life. He first sought it within the Christian faith of his mother, but surprisingly, he initially rejected Christianity. His aversion to this religion was primarily rooted in the poorly translated Latin versions of the scriptures available at the time. As a scholar trained in classical literature, Augustine found the primitive language of the Bible to be inadequate to capture the truth. Furthermore, the Bible's text was plagued with inconsistencies, further undermining his confidence in the Christian faith. And he also struggled with passages from the Old Testament that depicted a vengeful and violent God. Augustine's pursuit of truth led him to embrace Manichaeism. This religious movement promised to provide a rational explanation of reality without the need of faith. Manichaeism offered a problem to the solution of evil through its dualistic conception of the world, which posited two separate principles, good and evil. The good God is responsible for all good, which is equated with the spiritual and immaterial. The evil demiurge, the evil creator, is responsible for all evil, which is physical and material. In light of its belief that the creator God was the source of evil, Manichaeism dismissed the Old Testament since it was taught to deal with this deity. Moreover, on the level of ethics, Manichaeism relieved humans of responsibility for evil since everything deemed evil stemmed from the evil God and was caused by material factors. However, this moral exoneration eventually presented Augustine with intellectual dilemmas, prompting him to question the premise that the two divine principles were in conflict. This led him to conclude that neither principle could be omnipotent, thus rendering them by definition not divine. And Augustine slowly realized that Manichaeism required faith in its basic tenets, which were not rationally justified, leading him to adopt a skeptical stance briefly. Rising the academic ladder, while appointed as imperial professor and reader in Milan, he found in that city the answer to two fundamental questions with which he was struggling. From Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, first, he learned the allegorical exegesis of the Old Testament. The difficult and seemingly contradictory passages of scripture should not be read literally, but figuratively. The true significance of obscure biblical passages lies not in their literal words, but in the symbolic meaning that must be decoded carefully. Second, in Milanese Neoplatonic circles, which was a Christian variant of Neoplatonism, he learned that the nature of evil is non-being. God is good, and all that God has made is good. Everything that is, is created by the good God and is therefore good. Being and goodness thus coincide. Evil is the absence of good, consequently the absence of being. The source and essence of evil are not ontological, but ethical in nature, in that Neoplatonists identify evil with sin. Evil is engendered by human misconduct. These two crucial answers convinced Augustine that the truth is to be discovered in Christianity. He converted to Christianity 
and was baptized by Ambrose. This was originally mainly a philosophical conversion. He believed that Christianity offered the best perspective on truth. Upon converting to Christianity, he lost interest in pursuing a secular career and subsequently left Imperial Milan for his homeland in North Africa. His initially rather intellectual conversion to Christianity became more biblical and ecclesial when during a liturgical celebration in the Basilica of the port city of Hippo, today Anaba in Algeria, he was invited by the local bishop Valerius to assist him in his ministry. Augustine was ordained and succeeded Valerius on his death as bishop of Hippo. As a bishop, Augustine put his life at the service of his own church community in Hippo. He preached, and you see in the middle of the apse, the actual episcopal chair from which Augustine preached. He was active as a local civic judge. He took care of the poor. He established a religious community around his basilica, of which he himself was a member. And here you see the archaeological excavations of the monastery he founded around his basilica and to which he forced all the clerics of his diocese to live together with him. He also felt an explicit bond with the universal church. He traveled, wrote letters, participated in councils and spent much time in religious debates, especially against the Donatists and the Pelagians. In the second part of this lecture, we will delve extensively into the Donatist controversy. For now, I will confine my presentation to mentioning the two core themes from Augustine's response to the Donatists. Tolerance and ecclesial unity. Tolerance of sinners, forgiveness of sinners, and unity of the church. Second controversy. Pelagianism, a Christian religious movement named after Pelagius, comprising a diverse set of ideas held by Pelagius and his contemporaries, such as Celestius and Julian of Iclanum. Each of these authors, in their own way, put great emphasis on the Christian moral life. As they firmly believe that every individual ought to strive in a life in accordance with high moral standards, they held the conviction that God has granted each human being the inherent capacity to lead a virtuous life. Augustine did not agree. For that reason, I show you this picture here. For those who can read carefully the books, Augustine and the scrolls he is stamping with his feet on hold the name of Pelagius, Celestius and Julian. And this is a more expressive uh, iconography of the same Augustine in the middle, surrounded with four uh, successive popes, um, bishops of Rome, um, trampling on literally here Pelagius, Julian and Celestius. And this book is printed in my home university, but we will talk about this uh, in a minute. According to Augustine, the so-called Pelagians thus put a too strong emphasis on human freedom, forgetting that man always needs the help of God's grace, gratia. At the basis of Augustine's doctrine of grace lies his view on original sin. Since man's first sin, Adam's fall, mankind is, according to Augustine, imprisoned in sinfulness. Humans cannot escape from their addiction to sin. To use a metaphor, Augustine sees humanity as a helpless child who, because of universal human sinfulness, is in need of an all-encompassing grace, 
A child who cannot stand on his own two feet and always needs the hand of a helping and correcting parent. Humanity must constantly assist it by God's grace. The South African sculptor Anton Smit encapsulated Augustine's anti-Pelagian stance in a work titled Grace Shroud, accompanied by the quote, for grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do them. Augustine was a very active thinker. He wrote about all kinds of essential philosophical and theological questions. For instance, in his Confessions, which belong to the canon of world literature, he poetically describes his own conversion story, the odyssey of his restless soul, his personal discovery of grace as a mirror and as an invitation for all readers to follow him in this quest. And famous here on the slide are the opening words of this account. Our hearts are restless till they find rest in you, O God. And the Confessions can be considered as a prism of the totality of Augustine's life and thinking. The Visigothic sack of Rome in 410 prompted Augustine to compose his monumental work De Civitate Dei, the City of God. In this massive opus, he elaborates on his conception of the two cities, the earthly and the heavenly city. Among various themes, Augustine reflects on the intricate relationship between religion and the state. And we will thoroughly examine this paradigmatic work in the second part of the lecture. When Augustine was laying on his deathbed after a very eventful life, vandals were at the gate of Hippo. It could be no more symbolic. Augustine indeed lived at the end of a period. His thinking bridges the gap between antiquity and the Middle Ages. He died on August 28, 430. After a long journey, his remains now rest in the North Italian town of Pavia, in this beautiful 14th century shrine with images from his life carved onto it, such as his Milanese conversion experiences here. In his last will, he had only one request for his friends, to preserve his library in the tumultuous Africa of the time. His literary legacy was indeed saved. That his confriars succeeded in doing so is proven by our lecture and by this lecture series. After more than 16 centuries, Augustine is still being read, given food for thought, debate and meditation. One of Augustine's most essential and at the same time most vehemently protested contributions was his doctrine of grace. Hence he received the epithet Dr. Grazie, teacher of grace, from the early modern period onward. This subject was present in his thinking from the very beginning, but he dealt with it especially in a systematic way, as explained in the so-called Pelagian controversy. Although he elaborated, in other words, a system of grace, he nevertheless left some questions open. And these issues, supplemented by the fundamental question of how Augustine's doctrine of grace should be understood, was the subject of renewed debates in the centuries that followed his death with the respective discussion partners bringing into the discussion the needs, questions and intellectual paradigms of their own time and context. A compelling illustration of the dynamic nature of Augustinian inquiry is manifest in the contentious discussions amongst Carolingian medieval, early medieval theologians 
wherein their polemics revolved around the correlation between divine predestination and the eternal condemnation of the unregenerate. If God predestines those who are saved, does he also predestine those who will be damned, and in what way? Similarly, in the Reformed tradition, a sustained conversation emerged around Augustine's interpretation of post-baptismal sinfulness. Being forgiven by sin, original sin, by baptism, does that make a faithful, by definition, a sinner or not? Is having sinful inclinations enough to consider a faithful sinner or not? Furthermore, the spirited Roman Catholic debates between anti-Jansenists and their opponents, the so-called Jansenists, they did not call themselves Jansenists, only the anti-Jansenist called the Jansenist Jansenist, uh, epitomized the vigor of polemics surrounding the efficacy of grace. What does grace op operate? Is creational grace sufficient or do we need additional efficient grace? Further underscoring the passionate and at times divergent engagement of Augustinian grace discourses. Throughout the annals of theological history, it is evident that Augustine of Hippo occupies a central position. But also the disciplines of philosophy, philology and history have also traditionally evinced a great interest in Augustine. And this interdisciplinary appeal is exemplified by the first critical edition of his complete works accomplished by my colleagues in Leuven in the 1570s, I did not know them personally, of which you see the engraving that graced its cover here. Philosophy. The English philosopher Sir Anthony Kenny, for instance, states, of all the philosophers in the ancient world, only Aristotle had a greater influence on human thought. According to American historian of religion, Robert Louis Wilkin, Augustine towers over all. Some examples illustrate that Augustine's reception is much broader than it may seem at first sight. Let me begin with his most well-known accomplishment, his self-proclaimed autobiography, his Confessions. The question of whether Augustine positions himself as the first modern subject in this self-reflection is still a discussion topic for anthropologists and psychologists. Given his immense influence, he has become one of the most depicted saints in art history. From the precious manuscript illuminations of the Middle Ages to the inspiring paintings of Fra Angelico, conversion scene, and Botticelli, to the swirling sculptures of Bernini, and even to modern pop music. For instance, Sting chose the title Saint Augustine in Hell for one of his songs because he identified with Augustine's youthful struggle with relationships. Similarly, in his song, Saint of Me, Mike Jagger asks not to be made into a saint and suggests that real saints are figures like Paul and Augustine. Augustine's ideas are also frequently cited in Gratian's Decretum, making him of particular interest to legal historians and jurists. And similarly, in his letter from Birmingham jail, regarded as a foundational document of the civil rights era, Martin Luther King Jr. explicitly concurred with Augustine's statement, nam mihi lex esse non videtur quae justa non fuerit, which asserts that an unjust law is not a law at all. Augustine's De Genesi ad Literam, a work on Christian cosmology, is considered to be the, the most significant work in this field during antiquity and the Middle Ages. It's notable for its influence beyond theology. 
having been cited in the trial of Galileo Galilea, though not by the Inquisition against Galileo, but vice versa. Galileo Galilea invoked Augustine to support his contention that the Bible should never be read in contradiction to the current understanding of the empirical sciences. In addition to this, Zinan, my doctoral student from Leuven is also present here and he's working on this theme. Uh, Augustine's thinking about time, especially stemming from his reflection on the creation story in the last three books of the Confessions, got many philosophers and even scientists thinking. For instance, the widely acclaimed physicist Stephen Hawking referred to Augustine's realistic theory of time. Time really does exist. And when you have children, you know. Augustine's political reflections during a period of significant social and economic upheaval, as explored in his De Civitate Dei, are also relevant today, as evidenced by Joe Biden's use of a quote from the work during his inaugural address as a president of the United States in 2021. I'm wondering what he will quote next time. In this famous quote, echoing Cicero's philosophy, Augustine defines a populus, a nation, a people, by the common love object pursued by its members. And Augustine would certainly agree with Biden's call for peace and stability and would definitely concur with his quest for truth. Augustine would probably do less so with his plea for the ideals of the American dream. And Augustine would especially regret that Biden took this quote out of its original context and secularized it. With Augustine, the heavenly city is central and the earthly city to which Biden limited himself is ordered by its heavenly purpose. And this seamlessly transitions us to the second part of this lecture, the city, that is the church. And we have a break now or we wait for 10 minutes break now? Okay, we have a break. When I came to Hong Kong on Sunday, first I had to take a plane from Brussels to Frankfurt and then from Frankfurt to Hong Kong. The first flight was short, one hour, no lunch being served. The second one was a longer one, lunch and breakfast served. The first part is very similar of my lecture to the flight from Brussels to Frankfurt. <laughs> Be ready now for the long night flight. The second part of our pilgrimage with Augustine begins with a quote from one of his sermons that I included in the, in the title of my lecture. For you, I am a bishop. With you, I am a Christian. In another sermon, he states, we are bishops. Together with you, we are Christians. In this identification of Augustine as a pastor with his flock, he expresses that the essence of being church is being Christians together. Now we will explore with Augustine as a skillful guide what it means to form a church community together. We will study his ecclesiological ideals. Augustine speaks in an affectionate tone about the church. He calls the church the Christian's truest mother and repeatedly attributes to the church maternal characteristics. The church gives birth to Christians, nourishes them and provides them of life-giving love as milk. 
such an intimate and caring model of the church might appeal to many. Yet, just as all children need a mother to take care of them, Augustine believes that all people need the care of the church. And he repeats the old saying of Cyprian, there is no salvation outside the church. Augustine further stipulates, you shall abandon neither Christ nor the church. For how is he in Christ who abandons the church and who is not amongst Christ's members? Only within the church can one find real justice, genuine love, valid sacraments, the Holy Spirit, and true and complete grace. In short, only within the church one can find full redemption. And this perhaps is not an easy message in our contemporary pluralistic and secularized society. Be that as it may, the fact that Augustine believes in the absolute necessity of the church for human salvation is a given, and it's not a subject of scholarly debate. One question that, that does remain, however, is how exactly he understood the nature of the church. Augustine did not compose a handbook, De Ecclesia, a work in which he elaborated his ecclesiological system. So what I will be doing today is a quite complex reconstruction, bringing together his ideas on being Christian together. Augustine served the church of Hippo as a pastor. Throughout this period, he was also a prolific theologian. Augustine's experiences as a concrete ecclesial leader and his ecclesiological reflections thus constitute a permanent yet evolving hermeneutic circle. And this early 16th century sculpture expresses this twin aspect of Augustine's ecclesiology, the intertwining of doctrine and practice. You see Augustine depicted as bishop of the secular city of Hippo Regius. That's the physical city that appears the, above the book he is holding in his right hand. And this book is a symbolic reference to his book De Civitate Dei, the city of God, and thus to the heavenly city he discusses elaborately in this book. So what this artist aptly summarizes is that Augustine was in concrete reality a pastor of an earthly city marked by practical experiences and that it is precisely this historically situated pastor who reflected on the relationship between the earthly and heavenly city in his world famous De Civitate Dei. And that delicate balance between praxis and theory, between ideal and reality, will be a constant refrain this afternoon. We will focus on three ecclesiological models Augustine constructed. The church as a mixed body and a bond of love, first. Second, the pairing of the earthly and the heavenly cities. And third, the total Christ. Totus Christus. By exploring these three Augustinian ecclesial models, we will come to understand how Augustine strongly believes in the church as a cohesive, conciliatory, critical, cohabitating, and comprehensive Christological community, the subtitle of this second part. The first model, a tolerant and universal church against the Donatists. One of the reasons Valerius, the Greek-speaking bishop of Hippo, needed the eloquent Latin-speaking Augustine as an assistant and successor was the fierce Donatist controversy. The Donatist schism had existed for more than a century by that time. The schism divided North African Christianity into two primary camps that were sometimes literally at each other's throats. Donatism denied the validity of any sacraments celebrated by clerics who during the times of the persecutions of Christians had avoided martyrdom by collaborating with the pagan civil authorities. 
the so-called traditores and lapsi. Traditores, relics, handing over, and the English traitor comes from traditores, handing over sacred books and lapsi, Christians fallen away from their faith by making pagan sacrifices. Donatists thus endeavored to create a pure and elitist Christianity, and they advocated a strict separation between the church and the world, consequently between church and state. Anything within the Donatist church was holy and pure. Everything outside was sinful and to be rejected. Two dimensions can be discerned in Augustine's ecclesiological dealings with the Donatists, his firm belief in the mixed composition of the church and its universal unity. We turn then to the first dimension, the corpus mixtum, the church as a mixed body. The Donatists held to an elitist model of the church. For them, the church consists only of sinless members. Accordingly, in order to avoid the contagion of sin, all sinners should be immediately excluded from the church. The Donatists used biblical images to advocate for their claims. For example, they considered the church to be a closed garden, a sealed fountain. In order to depict the church as a closed and sinless community, the Donatist combined these same images from the Song of Songs with the call of Ephesians 5.27 to keep the church without stain or blemish. Similarly, the Donatists observed that Noah's Ark only hosts eight people, so a very small community. The church too should be limited to a small group of righteous people. For this reason, all sinners should be excommunicated from the church. That's the Donatist perspective. Augustine repeatedly argues that Donatist biblical exegesis is faulty and stresses that the earthly church is not restricted and is not an exclusive group. On the contrary, the church is a large and inclusive community, a corpus per mixtum, a corpus mixtum, containing saints and sinners. He writes, for example, but there are also many within who act against the church by living bad lives and by luring weak souls into their way of life. And there are some things done outside the church in Christ's name and not against the church, and some done within by the devil's party against the church. Saints and sinners inside the church, outside the church. Elsewhere, Augustine can say, those who are evil are corporeally intermingled and spiritually separated in the Catholic Church. As this second quotation demonstrates in the bodily mixture of the visible church, per mixtio corporalis, there is also a spiritual distinction, separatio spiritualis. Externally, there are sinners in the church here on earth and they should be tolerated. Internally, however, they are separated from the Ecclesia Sancta, the Holy Church, which is perfected only in heaven. Augustine thus pleads in favor of a permixta ecclesia. Responding to Donatist ecclesiological arguments, he notices that the garden mentioned in Song of Songs 2 2 contains both lilies and thorns, saints and sinners, and that there were also stinking animals on board of Noah's ark. Augustine agrees that the church should be stainless and spotless as per Ephesians 5.27, but he believes that this applies to the Ecclesia Qualis Futura Est and not to the Ecclesia Quae Nunc Est, the future church, not the church as she is now. Before the resurrection, the church is composed of good and bad people. Now is not a time of separatio, but of toleratio. In the end, Distinguishing sinners from non-sinners, goats from the sheep, wheat from the grain, chaff from the wheat, bad from the good fish, is God's prerogative and will take place 
at the final judgment. Here on earth, the only responsibility Christians have is to tolerate sinners and pray for their forgiveness. Since, as Augustine argues, in the end, we are all sinners and therefore we are all in need of forgiveness and tolerance ourselves. We now turn to the second dimension of Augustine's anti-Donatist ecclesiology, vinculum caritatis, the bond of love. The Donatists, renounced by the state, rejected the outside world as sinful. While the churches outside Africa rallied with the African Catholics against the Donatists, the Donatists postulated that the only true church was located in North Africa and was Donatist. According to Augustine, the Donatists allegedly found proof in scripture especially in the Song of Songs, that the true church was only to be found in Africa. Augustine obviously does not agree with this Donatist exegesis. Moreover, according to the Donatists, since the Transmarine Church was in communion with the North African Catholic Church, according to them, the Church of the Traditores, the traitors, it too was not the true church. Hence, the Donatists conceived of their own African Donatist church as the only surviving remnant, the holy rest. Augustine vehemently rejected this isolationist and separatist vision of the church. For example, he asserts, there is one church which alone is called Catholic. The schism caused by the Donatist party feels, according to Augustine, like a division of Christ himself. In dramatic tones, he laments the divided ecclesial community in his own city, in his own Hippo. If we are in unity, why are there two altars in this city? Why are there devoted, divided houses and divided marriages? Why is there a common bed and a divided Christ? When Donatism was outlawed by imperial decree, the Donatists viewed their persecution by the state as martyrdom. Based on Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the Donatists proclaimed their community to be the true church of the martyrs. We are martyrs, Thus, we are the true church because the true church is the church of the martyrs. Sometimes they purposefully sought martyrdom for themselves. And here Augustine introduced his famous distinction between cause and punishment. Authentic martyrdom requires not only the actual poina, the punishment, but also the correct causa, cause. As 1 Corinthians 13.3 stipulates, True martyrs are driven by caritas, quite different from many Donatists whose motivation, according to Augustine, was to break ecclesial unity. For the latter crime, breaking ecclesial unity, which was not a proper cause for acquiring the title of martyr, such a Donatist deserved the punishment they received. Augustine replied, so it's not martyrdom, it's a punishment they truly deserve on a legal basis. In Augustine's view, the Donatists' most serious crime and heinous sin was this. By their schism, they broke the vinculum caritatis, the bond of love, the unity of the church. In a manner of speaking, they were tearing the seamless tunic in which the barely clothed Christ had been crucified. Augustine uses this metaphor to very plastically express that despite the Puritan Donatist's effort to live in a perfect way, he deems their schism the worst possible offense. Evidently, therefore, my brothers and sisters, it does these people no good to preserve virginity, to be continent, to give alms. All these things that are thought of so highly in the church are no good to them at all because they are tearing the unity to shreds. That is the tunic of charity, the tunic of Christ. 
To make matters even worse, the Donatists not only broke ecclesial unity, they claimed the true church was only to be found in North Africa. Augustine firmly replied that, by definition, the church is Catholic, which literally means universal. No church is Catholic except the one that, as was promised, is spread throughout the whole world and extends even to the ends of the earth, which grows among the weeds and in the midst of wearisome scandals, looks for the repose that will come. Clear, I would say, even contemporary language. In the one church, unity comes first. Augustine firmly asserts, woe to those who hate the unity and make factions among men. If only they would listen to the one who wanted to make them one in one man for one man. Be in the one, be one thing, be one person. Beyond the Donatist controversy too, Augustine stresses that the universal church consists of many local churches spread geographically over the whole globe and amongst all nations in each town, region and province, these local churches all remain members of the unique church and they all share the same name. Augustine envisages this ecclesial unity in a scripturally imaginative way. The many nations gathered in the one church are living and holy stones cemented together with the force of love and peace. These stones form a building that will only be completed at the end of time. A building that only will be completed at the end of time, Augustine must have had experience with Belgian building companies. Augustine emphasizes that the unity of the church does not imply uniformity, but encompasses internal diversity and plurality. And this plurality is symbolized by the many languages in which the disciples proclaimed the gospel during Pentecost and after. Historical research teaches us that we must take Augustine's depiction of the Donatist as the absolute boogeyman with a grain of salt. The current relevance obviously lies not in polemic or repression, but in the plea for a broad and united church. Tars van Bavel concisely summarized this first church model of Augustine. Church not as exclusion, but as invitation. In short, the church as a conciliatory community, true Catholic cohesion. Finally, contrary to the Donatist rejection of the political sphere, Augustine advocated a separation, but not an opposition between church and state. And this argument leads us to the following ecclesial model. The second model we study today, the pilgrim church in the earthly city, relationship between state and church, between the earthly church and the heavenly church, critical cohabitation. On August 24, 410, the city of Rome was sacked by the Visigoths of Alaric. Although Rome was by then neither the political center nor the factual capital of the Roman Empire, it was still regarded as the center of the world, the eternal city. The sack of Rome had huge symbolic significance. Its fall seemed to mark the end of an era the 9-11 of antiquity. Many Christians who conflated the fates of Christianized Roman state and the church feared that the fall of Rome would negatively impact the future of the church as well. Augustine replied to these concerns in his De Civitate Dei by disconnecting church and state. Augustine built his argumentation on the biblically inspired concept of the two cities, Civitas Terrena and Civitas Celestis, the earthly and heavenly city. 
two distinct but related cities. The most fundamental distinction Augustine draws between the two cities concerns the objects of their love. Whether one's citizenship is in the earthly city or the heavenly city depends on the basic orientation of one's desires. Two loves then have made two cities. Love of self, even to the point of contempt for God, made the earthly city. And love of God, even to the point of contempt for self, made the heavenly city. Though this definition of the two cities implies their mutual exclusivity, as if no citizen of the heavenly city could belong to the earthly city and vice versa, Augustine insists that the two cities not only coexist during this temporal life, but are even intermingled with each other. They cohabitate. In this world, in fact, these two cities remain intermixed and intermingled with each other until they are finally separated at the last judgment. Hence, the distinction between the two cities is eschatological. The earthly city, moreover, is not wholly negative. Christians should not completely avoid it, for it provides temporal goods that benefit Christians and non-Christians alike. In this regard, Augustine particularly stresses the capacity of the earthly city to stimulate earthly peace, stability. While temporal peace does not give real happiness, only the peace of the heavenly city does that, and while temporal peace is really only a form of consolation for earthly misery, Augustine nevertheless does consider earthly peace, temporal peace, as a bonum, a good, from which Christians too can benefit. Just as non-Christians benefit from effective Christian governments over temporal matters, if you have a Christian emperor, for instance, Christians benefit from the temporal goods of the earthly city. God has granted humanity certain goods necessary for this life. Human society, temporal peace, bodily health, food, water, clothes, medicine, and so forth. God has also stipulated that those who use these gifts rightly will gain eternal life, while those who do not will not receive these eternal goods and will even lose the temporal ones. Christians thus share with non-Christians a basic dependence on temporal things, and both Christians and non-Christians make use of the earthly city's goods. Nevertheless, the heavenly city uses the goods of the earthly city toward radically different eternal ends. Given that we are all mortal creatures, Augustine believes in a concordia, a harmony between the two cities for affairs pertaining to our mortality. His call for the proper use of earthly peace, which is common, communis, to the good and the bad alike, is therefore not surprising. However, if we do not use that temporal peace well, then at the end of time, eternal peace will not be our portion. Thus, while Christians can in one sense be a good citizens of the broader society, their fundamental mode of existence remains one of pilgrimage, of traveling. Their ultimate hope is for heavenly and not just earthly peace. Augustine does not necessarily regard the two cities as diametrically opposed, nor does he regard the earthly city, our worldly society and political order as fundamentally negative. He does, however, place the earthly city in the context of the heavenly city. Although here on earth we can work together for peace, harmony and stability, all this is only a passing phase. He calls it a pilgrimage toward heavenly happiness. Hence, he regards the earthly church as a pilgrim church. Augustine expresses this with a beautiful biblical image. The earthly church is God's tent here on earth, a temporary accommodation. We are on pilgrimage. At the end of time, this tent will become a beautiful house, the heavenly church. 
we now turn to the notion of the pilgrim church. The spiritual city, according to Augustine, does not coincide with the earthly church, but with the heavenly church, for which the earthly church is a preparation. Consequently, being a good and obedient citizen of the human state should not exclude heavenly citizenship. This double citizenship of Christians is based on Augustine's image of the heavenly city as a society of pilgrims in this world. And you can read together with me. I will not read everything, so <laughs> as a matter of speaking. Yeah. When I say in Leuven, you can read together with me, no student would read out loud. Yeah. <laughs> This heavenly city then, while it sojourns on earth, calls citizens out of all nations and gathers together a society of pilgrims of all languages, not scrupling about diversities. Now I jump, whereby peace, earthly peace, is secured and maintained, but recognizing that however various these are, they all tend to one and the same end of earthly peace. In its pilgrim state, the heavenly city possesses this peace by faith, and by this faith it lives righteously when it refers to the attainment of that peace, every action towards God and man. For the life of the city is a social life. Though Christians may at various points assume high, even supreme office in the earthly city, being an emperor, for instance, they nevertheless remain strangers in a foreign land, longing for their final return to the patria where they will be united with God. As citizens of the heavenly city, Christians can only be sojourners, travelers in the earthly city. In this view, Christians as heavenly cit citizens in the earthly city can only be transmigrants. The image of a pilgrimage clarifies, firstly, how the earthly church should be understood, and secondly, the relationship between church and state. Firstly, the earthly church merely paves the way for the heavenly church. That the earthly church is not yet the perfect celestial church should instill a feeling of humility. Humility, which is, according to Augustine, the most important Christian virtue. Second, while the earthly church does its traveling towards its heavenly fulfillment through this world, even collaborating with the world for certain honorable causes, peace, stability, the earthly church should not blindly or naively engage in such cooperation. Precisely the earthly church's sojourning character, the recognition that the earthly church belongs neither to this earth nor to any specific ideology or political system, should urge the church to always recall its prophetic role of social critique and moral witness. The early church may collaborate with state and society, but always at a critical distance. In some, the church as a critical cohabitating community. The church model, the totus Christus, the total Christ. Perhaps a small word of explanation with this image, you will see this iconography returning. It's a medieval legend, according to which at a certain moment, Augustine as a bishop in his Episcopal house received a guest, a pilgrim, doing a pilgrimage. And you see the pilgrim has the pilgrim hat, the pilgrim staff. Um, and you see Augustine being dressed as an Augustinian monk. And he received in all hospitality the pilgrim, washing his feet, quite biblical, referring to the Last Supper, the humility of Christ, 
washing the feet of his disciples as a symbol of his complete sacrifice. And according to that medieval legend, evidently, the guest that Augustine so humbly and hospitably received in his house was Christ himself. Um, this artistic tradition, I think, illuminates very strongly the image Augustine uses for his idea of the totus Christus, which I will now explain. In De Civitate Dei, which we explored now quite thoroughly in the last 15 minutes, Augustine also repeatedly asserts that Christ established the church and that he is still governing and ruling the church. Quoting the Song of Songs and Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, Augustine envisages the church as a sponsa Christi, the bride of Christ, an image that he appeals to in order to express the intimate mutual love between Christ and his church. Augustine describes the intimate relationship between the church and Christ by appealing to the Pauline metaphor of the church as Christ's body, with Christ himself as head. As Augustine phrases it in his sermon on Psalm 62, if Christ is the head, we are the limbs. The whole church, spread abroad everywhere, is his body, and of that body, he is the head. Augustine does not restrict this corporate metaphor to a functional or a hierarchical relation between head and body. The much debated adage, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, applies to Augustine's Christological ecclesiology. He sees head, Christ and body, we, the church, as united into the one total, whole, integral Christ, the totus Christus. In Augustine's mind, the name Christ embraces three aspects, which he explains in the opening sentences of this sermo, sermon 341. Briefly stated, Christ first is God. Second, as God and human, Christ is mediator and head of the church. Third, in the whole Christ, the head, Christ associates itself with the body. Augustine thus indicates that the whole Christ includes both Christ as the caput, head, and the whole corpus, the body, the church, all its members. Only by incorporating all believers, the members of his body, Christ can be considered whole, the totus Christus. Evidently, the Pauline text that impressed Augustine the most in this regard is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27, in which the unity of the one person mirrors that of the one Christ. The one person consisting of body and soul and the one Christ consisting of body, humanity and head, Christ himself. Explaining this Pauline pericope in his um, sermon on Psalm 142, Augustine asserts that Paul here is doing more than merely making a comparison. According to Augustine, Paul is describing a reality. Christ really is like this. The totality of body and members are Christ. Augustine puts the following statement in Christ's mouth. Little by little you will build up my body. And he is talking to his flock, to the community of Christians. Little by little you will build up my body by uniting your holy ones to me until I attain my full stature. Augustine furthermore explains that the present incomplete state is not due to Christ being incomplete as a person without his members, but is rather due to Christ's own explicit desire to be complete together with them. The fullness of Christ is head and body. The church consequently is the fullness of Christ because without his faithful, Christ cannot be the head. In other words, Christ find his completion in his members. 
But the reverse is also true. The church is the expression and realization of the fullness of Christ. The specificity of Augustine's notion, intuition of the totus Christus, is that he sees Christ identifying himself with his followers. In Aratio 142, that is the second quote on the slide, states, Therefore, Christ suffers in my flesh as it still struggles on earth. Similarly, in Inaratio in Psalm 86, Augustine observes that Christ does not call out to Saul, Paul, in his way to Damascus from heaven and say, why are you persecuting my servants? Rather, Christ cries out, why are you persecuting me? Christ thus suffers because his members suffer. Augustine's assistance that while the head is in heaven, the body is still on earth, could be read as a mission statement. If Christ suffers in people suffering on earth, the church, as Christ's body on earth, has the task, on Christ's behalf, of helping those in need. The notion of the totus Christus is therefore not only an ontological ecclesial category, it is at the same time an ethical appeal or an ecclesial program. The inarationes in Psalmos, that are Augustine's sermons on the Psalms, is the work in which Augustine crystallizes the view that Christ identifies himself with his members in the totus Christus. The mechanism of that identification is the canonic ID that Christ took upon himself the human condition for the sake of human salvation. Augustine stresses that Christ did not pray Psalm 22, O oh God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross on his own behalf? After all, God could not have forsaken Christ who is God himself. Now Christ voices these lines on behalf of the believers whom he incorporates on the cross. And in Aratio in Psalm 21, Augustine insists that Christ prayed Psalm 22 because we were in Christ. We, the church, the body of Christ, because Christ made our sins his sin. And here we touch the DNA of Augustine's faith. The church is a Christological community, or rather, the church is the Christological community. The plane is descending. Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> we have an old Flemish expression. That's the dialect of the region I come from. The kerk in het midden houden, literally translated, keeping the church in the middle. And this expression refers, for my region, to the historical reality that villages were built around the church building. Hence, the church stood literally in the center, in the middle of a village. On a metaphorical level, this expression advises us to give something its proper place and importance. And in this sense, the expression features the church at center stage, a claim that in many ways would be dear to Augustine. At the same time, however, also in my dialect, this expression suggests that you should give something no more importance than it deserves. The correct place is necessary, but also sufficient. And this idea is also quite similar to Augustine's ecclesiological intuitions. On a more figurative level, and for that uh, my country is famous, compromise consensus, the expression is used to urge to look in discussions for a middle ground, to find consensus and to strive for unity and harmony, which is the core of Augustine's ecclesiological life. Finally, we have also discovered 
that his ecclesiological models occupy a middle between theory and praxis. In Augustine's ecclesiology, the concrete context and pastoral praxis are mutually linked with his doctrinal and theoretical concerns. The three Augustinian church models we have considered today, the two cities, universal unity, and the whole Christ, could in a certain way be summarized according to a scheme that Augustine uses himself to describe the course of his own conversion from exterior to interior, resulting in superior. We could then say that his ecclesiology has external, internal, and transcendent aspects, or at least that there are external, internal, and transcendent identity pointers in Augustine's understanding of the one true church. The external dimension is the relation between the church and the state, or it consists of Augustine's reflections about the place and role of the church in secular society. Augustine accepted a mutual, utilitarian understanding between church and state. The state benefited from the church's well-organized and mobile hierarchical structure. The church, in its turn, assumed responsibility for official commissions and used the facilities that the Roman Empire had to offer. Also, Augustine assumed the secular responsibilities that were assigned to him. But he did not allow himself to be reduced to an uncritically obedient servant of the state. As we have observed, under certain conditions, Christians can have a double citizenship. Now, fundamentally, they are, as we would say today, transmigrants. This is not to suggest that Christians have no interest in temporal goods or that religion and politics are completely opposed. Still, the primary focus or locus of proper worship is the church, which consists of the citizens of the heavenly city currently living on earth, though there are also citizens of the earthly city within the visible borders of the church. The final point suggests a common ground between church and world. Just as Christians cannot escape from the world to the church, so also they cannot escape the world in the church. Augustine thus protects the faithful from escapism and otherworldliness. In the end, the Christian's task in both the church and the world is the same to be patient with each other and to promote peace in all possible ways. Interior dimension, tolerant and harmonious. The Donatists attempted, according to Augustine, they pretended to remain pure, refusing any form of accommodation for all to human errors or any form of collaboration with the state. Consequently, the Donatist propagated a strict and restrictive church model. Augustine reacted vehemently and advocated an open, tolerant, forgiving, inclusive church model. Everybody is welcome. Nobody should be excluded. Unity and universality are keywords in Augustine's response to the Donatist. But such words are not primarily expressions of formal, hierarchical, or institutional notions, but are rather expressions of love, caritas, Christian love. In particular, the words unity and universality express Christ's love for humankind, humankind's love for Christ, and the love of Christians for each other. Augustine's belief in the imperfect nature of the visible church does not imply that he is overly realistic or utterly pessimistic. He does believe the church could and should be perfect, but he reserves this sanctity and purity to the heavenly church, the city of God. For Augustine, the Ecclesia Catholica is therefore much more than the universal church spread over the whole world. It is primarily the vision, the dream, 
of the heavenly Jerusalem. As a pastor of a port city, Augustine expresses this eschatological vision of ecclesial perfection with the following metaphors. While in the city of Babylon, the earthly city, while in the city of Babylon we walk around, our hope, our anchor safely lies in the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Babylonian wind and storms that are the temptations during our pilgrimage do not bother us. The church has a transcendent foundation, a heavenly origin and objective, Christ. The notion of the totus Christus is, according to the preacher of Hippo, not only an instructive theological category or an inspiring spiritual image, it is a reality. For that reason, in Sermon 341, Addressing his flock, Augustine expresses his joy and gratitude not only for our becoming Christians, but also for our becoming Christ. As he phrases it in this sermon, together he, with capital Christ, he and we, personal pronouns, which according to Augustine can be exchanged in this context, he and we together are the whole person of Christ. That Christological unity or identification between Christ and the church is ultimately the main reason for respecting the unity and universality of the church. Leaving the church is leaving Christ and vice versa. A broad, united and critically engaged church that is. At the same time, the heavenly Christ is both the Christian's eschatological goal and the model to live by which to live in this world. Hence, all the ecclesiological notions we have discussed today are interwoven in Augustine's understanding of the church as cohesive conciliatory, critical cohabitating and Christological community. The church is in the full sense of the world, the existence and reality of Christ. Only the presence of the one whole Christ makes the church a we in history. And therefore, Augustine resonantly declared from his pulpit, together we are Christians. For the same reason, I began my lecture by thanking you as my cherished audience, because Augustine showed our shared identity as Christians, even stronger Together we are Christ. And this Augustinian lesson is in particular significant in this period of Lent, during which we prepare for Easter. Augustine teaches us that we journey together, unified as fellow pilgrims towards Paschal Jerusalem. And as a good guide, Augustine shows us the way. Being pilgrims is the authentic significance of our Easter faith. For all these reasons, and in deep gratitude for your attention and participation today, I extend my heartfelt wishes to all of you, fellow pilgrims, for a truly blessed Easter. Thank you. It is my honor to be the respondent for the Augustine Expert Seminar this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Dupont, for your profound and insightful lecture. Remarkably, you have highlighted how Augustine, as a Christian and as a bishop, contemplates the mystery of God as a pilgrim. Your talk elevates us to a new level of understanding and interpreting Augustine. My response this afternoon will have two parts. First, I seek to apply your emphasis on Augustine's own life journey to reorient our attention to the Augustinian scholarly discussions. And second, I address the issue of reception. Throughout the centuries, there have been scholarly discussions on whether there is a continuity 
or whether there is indeed a discontinuity in the thought of Augustine. Some scholars argue that there is a discontinuity because some themes, such as the doctrine of grace and predestination, are not emphasized in his early writings before Pelagian controversy. On the other hand, some scholars, including Pierre-Marie Humbert, analyze that although some themes enjoy a greater emphasis in his later career, indeed, there were echoes in his earlier works. Therefore, similarities are more than dissimilarities. <laughs> Professor Dupont, in your book, Preacher of Grace, you also demonstrate how there are strong links and connections on the doctrine of grace between the anti-Donatist and the anti-Pelagian works. I agree with your opinion. Building on your talk this afternoon, I gather that by paying attention to the life of Augustine, coupled with textual analysis, could reorient our approach to these scholarly disputes. The Donatist controversy happened before the Pelagian controversy. The contexts of Augustine were affected by a variety of pastoral and doctrinal questions that he was facing. Faced with Donatists, Augustine wrestled with the Donatist ecclesiological ideology of an elitist pure church without any sinners. Further along Professor Dupont's line of focus, that is journeying with the spiritual, pastoral, and theological pilgrimage of Augustine, I now try to use his remarkably honest autobiography, Confessions, as an illustrative example for understanding his conversion and his relentless comebacks against heresies. During his personal struggles against sin, painfully and gradually, he was led to understand that we all need God's grace. His confession of sins is intimately connected to the goodness of God. Confession, therefore, has two elements for Augustine, turning away from our sins, and perhaps more importantly, praising God for his mercy and grace. As we read Augustine's experience in his confessions, we understand that one cannot rule out the possibility of sin even after baptism. He points out that our perseverance to do good and avoid evil is also a grace from God. If Donatists argue that all members of the pure church are spotless, and Pelagians think that human beings can rely on our own effort to be sinless, it is tantamount or equivalent to saying that we own grace, or grace belongs to us, or grace originates from us. This is pride simply because it is God, not human beings, who is the origin of grace. This line of thought continues in his City of God, which highlights the intermingling of holy and sinful people in the church here on earth. Moreover, Donatus' perusal of a pure church means that they themselves play the role of a judge to determine who are the spotless people eligible to stay in the elitist church. Against this heresy, Augustine argued that the separation of sinners and holy people in the church is God's prerogative. This is in line with the Jewish understanding of God as the only judge. His emphasis on human need for God's grace and human sinfulness reflects his own contemplation on human weakness from both the ecclesiological and eschatological dimensions. In his discussion of the earthly church as pilgrimage, we are on our voyage, pilgrim traveling on the road to the heavenly city. At the same time, Augustine does not undermine the importance of our earthly journey even though the earthly city is temporary, good works are still important. We can see that in his confessions, 
the theme of powerlessness of human beings in need of God's grace is already evident. Though there have been different foresight in response to different contexts, Augustine's characteristic attitude provides a consistent thread for linking various aspects of his writings in his entire career. The love of God and as the shepherd for his flock, his love of his fellow Christians. While Augustine writes with a purpose, the question is, how are his ideas being received? This leads to the second part of my response. In this part, I will continue with a focus on Augustine's life, but with a slight shift of attention to the theme of reception. First, how Augustine himself is affected by others. Second, how his thought was received by his audience in Augustine's days. And finally, how his thought is received, interpreted, and further developed in our context nowadays. On the first point, Augustine is deeply influenced by Ambrose, particularly his teaching on a coherence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. From this and from the thoughts of New Platonic circles, Augustine is enlightened to see how his own personal struggle against sin is not a mixture of good and bad evil, bad nature. Rather, because of sin, human freedom is wounded. Augustine has an accurate observation of our powerlessness in face of sin. With moral impotence and guilt, it is impossible for us to free ourselves from this sinful state. Human beings need God's grace to liberate us. In other words, Augustine's emphasis on sin could be regarded as the backdrop to highlight the gratuity and abundance of God's grace. In this way, the anthropology of Augustine is not altogether negative. On the contrary, with reference to his own life journey and reflection, we can see that he puts forward a critically realistic, positive, and dynamic anthropology. As Professor Dupont explains, Augustine, as a bishop, writes extensively for his fellow Christians with rhetorical training, he is a good preacher whose sermons and writings are in a style accessible to the audience of his time. At the same time, it is probable that Augustine himself could be frustrated because after all his years of fighting against heterodox views, he still faced heresies in his old age. Regarding our, uh, regarding our exception, reception of Augustine's thought nowadays, we can analyze it from various perspectives. Augustine is honored as a saint in the Catholic tradition. He is like us in all things, even to sin. In terms of contextual and practical theology, his example of seeking holiness in the midst of the external environment faced by him all speak to us nowadays how we could strive to seek justice and peace and maintaining our faith in God in this world of violence and marginalization. In terms of spirituality and the perspective of popular devotion, Saint Monica, the mother of Augustine, is recognized as the patron saint of mothers by Catholics. The example of Monica praying for his son's conversion is a valuable resource for pastoral, return, for pastoral concerns. On the screen is the collect prayer on the memorial of St. Monica on August 27th every year. From the theological perspective, however, the situation is more complicated because Augustine's context of doing theology and his theological resources are different from ours nowadays. While it is no doubt that there is permanent value in Augustine's thought, further adaptations are called for in order for him to speak to us in our own historical and cultural contexts. 
since Professor Dupont has elaborated on the central theological pursuit of Augustine on ecclesiolo ecclesiology. I would now slightly turn our attention to Augustine's fathoming of the mystery of the triune God. In order to seek an analogous and yet imperfect understanding of the inner life of the Trinity, that is the immanent Trinity, Augustine proposed a psychological analogy in terms of the three human distinct activities of memory, understanding, and love. Augustine's key point is that all these three activities are distinct and yet inseparably one. Therefore, we can use them as an imperfect analogy to fathom the mystery of the imminent trinity. Nowadays, there are criticisms of his analogy as abstract, ahistorical, and not interpersonal. However, if we seek to understand it from the perspective of interiority, which is also evident in Augustine's autobiography, Confessions, we understand that his psychological, his psychological analogy is the achievement of his own deep introspective reflections. His deep reflections speak aloud his intimate relationship with the loving and merciful God. Of course, it is anachronistic to have expected Augustine to address the issue of intersubjectivity, which is a hallmark characteristic of our modern times. In this regard, Bernard Lonergan, a Canadian theologian and philosopher in the 20th century, seeks to further develop the Augustine analogy in a more intersubjective and dynamic manner. He transposes Augustine's ideas towards an intentionality analysis. Succinctly stated, Lonergan elaborates that the dynamism of human intellectual consciousness and deliberation forms an analogy for understanding the respective divine processions of generation and inspiration. The first procession pertains to the intellect. We judge when we gather the sufficiency of evidence. The second procession pertains to the intellect towards the will. We choose according to what we judge. These two processions within human consciousness provide an imperfect but analogous understanding of the divine processions doctrinally known as generation and inspiration. The purpose of Lonergan is to further develop the psychological analogy of Augustine and express it in cross-cultural and existential anthropological terms. To conclude my response this afternoon, I would highlight three points. First, the approach of Professor Dupont, that is tracing the life journey of Augustine, has the distinctive advantage of a narrative approach. Everyone likes stories. The lens of seeing Augustine as a person gives us a privileged perspective to understand his writings, to give meanings to us nowadays. My second point is, without doubt, Augustine's writings contain significant achievements that are permanently valid. He is an associative writer for a variety of purposes in different contexts. Therefore, different criteria are required to assess the profound nature and value of his contribution, depending on his concerns. For pastoral concerns, the criteria could be accessibility to his audience in terms of helping them to understand the Christian faith as well as the effectiveness and transformation effect on this audience in terms of actions and living out their faith, orthopraxy. His autobiography, Confessions, is a typical example to illustrate how Augustine is a very good and effective preacher. At the same time, his autobiography also provides rich resources for deep understanding of theological thoughts. From the theological perspective, Augustine's love of God and his fellow Christians, and his relentless efforts to safeguard the Orthodox Christian faith is a perennial example 
for Christians of all generations. Finally, I will highlight that the title of this lecture, Augustine of Hippo's Life, Reflections and Ecclesiology as a Pilgrimage, is a shorthand which amply summarizes our attitude for appropriation of the writings and thoughts of Augustine. In our fathoming of the mysteries of the divine God, be it ecclesiological, Trinitarian, spiritual, and pastoral, we are on our pilgrimage on this earthly journey in a mirror dimly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Carlton Young. Uh, I think he, um, he should be more frankly to say that uh, I'm not a specialist in Augustine. <laughs> 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 I just want to share, a, um, uh, a, as a few uh, working in uh, Hong Kong Chinese uh, context, yeah, the reception of the uh, Augustine. Yeah, I appreciate very much uh, Professor Dupont's uh, presentation today, particularly because he highlighted uh, Augustine's uh, identity as a pastor, as a bishop. I think that is a key to understand uh, Augustine's works. I bring this small pocket-sized book here. Uh, it is edited by me 20 years ago. <laughs> It's a, a real pocket size because the, the publisher asked me to uh, edit a uh, real pocket size uh, volume to help the ordinary Christians or young pastor to understand uh, Augustine as they, especially Augustine's uh, meaningful for them. Yeah, so I pick up the main theme, Augustine as a pastor, yeah, to uh, help the uh, ordinary Christians or pastor to understand the significance of Augustine. I think uh, underlying most, if not all, of Augustine's uh, uh, publications or writings is his identity as the bishop. I think that is very important. I think he is not particularly interested in speculating why three in one or one in three. He wants to highlight that the Trinity is related to the restoration of the image of God in human being. That is a real partial problem. He's not particularly interested in debate with uh, uh, Pelagius because it relates to partial issue, how the Christians to grow up. He is not particularly interested in writing a history or a philosophy of history uh, about the seat of God, but he wants to address a partial issue, how Christians live after the fall of the Roman Empire, something like that. So all of these are underlying his identity as a bishop, as a pastor. I think that is very important. I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Professor Dupont to highlight this point of view. And uh, I would like to share with you the, um, the, 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 the part of uh, uh, the quote he, he mentioned that uh, uh, for you, I'm a bishop, with you, I'm a Christian. And before that and after that, the, the, the statement are also very important that uh, when he faced the, the congregation, he, he, he has the feeling of fear and trembling. I think all the young pastor have this kind of feeling. When you face the congregation, especially when I was a pastor, uh, I just graduated from the uh, uh, Divinity School of Philosophy Seminary, many of the uh, uh, congregation, they are of the age of my father or mother. So how you preach to them? <laughs> I think this is a very, uh, a, a, a fear and a trembling experience. But he also mentioned that, yeah, but when I think about together with you as a Christian, I find comfort. I think that is very important. And also, of course, as a bishop, this is a duty, but together with you as a Christian, this is grace. So, but, but I don't like that very much. He said that, well, uh, facing the uh, congregation, it will involve danger or risk. I think nowadays when we have the Article 23, we know that that is real. I'm not so sure whether one day in my congregation will turn me in to report to the police that I violated Article 23. Or, or one day I find some of my congregation, the members, they say, they make the confession, a repentance, whatever. Uh, yeah, and then whether, whether the, the Catholic priest will turn, turn him in. <laughs> I think we have this kind of experience, but I find that it's a real comfort that we find salvation, grace, and help. 
together with our congregation, yeah, because we are also Christian. Uh, thank you very much for hiding the, the uh, his uh, 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 state uh, identity as a, a pastor. Uh, but I would like to further uh, share a few uh, observation about the Chinese context. Nowadays, especially in mainland China, there are lots of uh, scholars studying Augustine, but usually they are they have the training in philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. So their interest is, say, Augustine's philosophy of time, uh, Augustine's uh, 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 theodicy, freedom of will, uh, or his uh, understanding of humanity yeah, in dialogue with uh, Confucianism, all these philosophical issues. But I think in order to help them to understand more properly about Augustine's position, I think to highlight his uh, position as the bishop, it's very important to clarify some of the possible misunderstanding uh, uh, if you just approach him from a very philosophical point of view. Yeah, so I think uh, that is a very important uh, 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 reminder uh, from Professor uh, uh, Dupont's uh, uh, lecture today. And, uh, and also I think for the churches in China, we also have the experience of being persecuted. I think the debate with the Donatists is have this kind of background, they have to face the problem after the persecution, whether you want to preserve a pure church without those laps in the persecution, or you have to some sort of rehabilitate, I don't want to say the German word, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the reconciliation with those who lapse. I think the Chinese church faced similar problem, especially after the, the uh, open and reform uh, policy yeah, because uh, at that time we, we find that some perhaps lapse are there and some identify themselves as the pure church. They don't bow before any political power and how they can work together. I think um, um, the, uh, the, the lesson uh, we can learn from Augustine, yeah, um, how to reconcile uh, between these two parties. I think that is also a very important uh, 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 reminder. And, uh, and well, I already say something about the uh, debate, uh, the, 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 the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, it's not just speculation about one in three or three in one, but it's about the restoration of the image of God in humanity. I think that is very important for the dialogue between Christianity and Confucianism. Christianity is not just talk about original sin, the negative thing, but also about the positive restoration of the image of God in human being. And that's why uh, some uh, uh, scholars say uh, Ji Bongna, he restored, uh, find that there are some sort of uh, deification also in uh, Augustine, yeah, that is uh, re related to his uh, doctrine of the image of God. There are, there are also some positive uh, uh, way of restoring this image, not just negative uh, uh, understanding of humanity. He's a very dynamic understanding. I think that is very important. And also uh, facing um, the Hong Kong churches, nowadays many of the pastors face the problem that many of our churchgoers go somewhere else. <laughs> Not in Hong Kong, but some other countries. Okay, uh, we have the experience of diaspora again. Hong Kong is a diasporic city. Many of our, 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 our fathers and, and so on, they so they migrate from mainland China to Hong Kong. Now they migrate again to somewhere else, to America or, or, or United Kingdom or Australia. I think that kind of diaspora experience will be quite comparable to the experience of pilgrimage. We are not stay, keep stating in a, or staying in a particular place. We have this kind of moving forward experience yeah, perhaps this kind of uh, 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 sense of pilgrimage may help them to make sense of their journey of moving beyond the comfort zone in Hong Kong to a new places. Perhaps this may help us to uh, uh, do our partial work even when they are going away. We have to experience this kind of uh, pilgrimage, yeah, but in a very geographical way, <laughs> not just spiritual way, yeah, but geographical way of uh, uh, pilgrimage is a diaspora. So uh, finally, I just want to say that uh, thank you very much for bringing in the pilgrimage uh, understanding. I like this image very much because from time to time I remind myself that as a systematic theologian, no system is perfect. Any theology is theologia viatorum, theology of pilgrimage. Yeah, we are trying to understand God in a very imperfect way and hope that uh, we'll one day we'll, we'll meet him. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Thank you. I, I hope all this is recorded. That a systematic theologian saying that he is not perfect. Um, I think Augustine would feel very well at home in Hong Kong. It's a port city. There is trade. There is a lot of movement, a dynamic city. And I think what you touched upon, Augustine is first and foremost a pastor. And that's in a quite recent insight. Uh, only some decades ago, we started studying his sermons again. Sermons were not studied, were considered to be not scientific, not original, you know, pastoral, repetitive, moralistic. Why would you study the sermons? Eh? Uh, de Civitate Dei, De Trinitate. But from Procedius, Augustine's dear friend and, and first biographer, we know that Augustine during the whole day was active as a pastor. And not only after supper, late in the evening, he started writing his theological treatises. Well, he dictated them, he did not write himself. But doing theology, systematic theology, was something late in the evening, sometimes deep in the night. And in certain passages of De Civitate Dei, you see, this must have been written late in the evening. Um, <laughs> but it's that one and the same Augustine. The theologian is pastor and the pastor is theologian. And he is theologian because of his pastoral responsibilities. We see that all his theological endeavors are answers to pressing urgent needs. De Civitate, Sack of Rome, De Civitate Dei, discussion with Arians, De Trinitate, letters on human freedom and grace, the Pelagian controversy. So he is a very practically oriented uh, theologian. And, and in that perspective, um, rediscovering his sermons is a gold mine. For instance, both of you talked about Trinitarian theology. So he preached also uh, in the period he was active against the Donatists, evidently about ecclesiology, the church, saints and sinners, sacraments. Um, but in those same sermons, he also preaches about the Trinity. And that's a link we would never make if we do not study his sermons. In his sermons against Donatist ecclesiology emphasizing unity and universality, he preaches that Christ shares the life of the church by giving his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the ghost, to his body. So the unity of the church is the unity of the Trinity. So Trinitarian life and ecclesial life are mutually linked with each other. And that's the pastor or theologian. And for that reason, to all the students over here, good pastors need to be good theologians. But you can only be a good theologian if you are a pastor. Oh, I, I just want to say a few words. You know, thank you, uh, Professor De Bon's uh, um, inspiring lecture and also Erica's uh, thought-provoking uh, response. Um, yeah, I, I want some uh, practical question because when we talk about um, conflicts in the church, like Donism and 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 the argument between Donism and and Augustine. Yeah, and, and the, uh, Augustine said, um, our church is a mixture of uh, saints and sinners, you know, it's not a, an elite community, it's not only for, for, for people with strong faith, but sometimes with uh, weak faith, even we, we, we commit sin. Yeah, and uh, we talk about unity and tolerance. When, when I come to the term tolerance, and suddenly I think, you know, uh, like uh, St. Peter asked, uh, asked Jesus, what's the limit of uh, forgiveness? Yeah, how many times should I forgive uh, uh, my, my colleague who, who hurt me? And uh, is there any limit or bottom line of tolerance? For example, the heresy or uh, some fraction within the community? Yeah, that's the, the first you know, uh, thing come to my mind, comes to my mind. And then the second one is... Um, <clears throat> Um, I appreciate that, uh, especially in the city of God, you know, um, St. Augustine said the church, like, like the, uh, the, the uh, painting, uh, the church is in the middle of earthly city and heavenly city. 
And I think uh, it is very important that um, some people would um, identify the church as the heavenly city, you know, or the city of God. It seems that the city of man is only the members of the earthly city. We'll join that. I think as St. Augustine says, the church composed of sinners and, and, and saints. So the, but the church has a very special mission or ministry to, um, because we, we can, like a priest can facilitate sacraments and, and, this, um, and dispense uh, the, uh, the grace you know, through different ministries in a church. But um, yeah, if the church composed of sinners and saints, that means not all the members of the church can enter the heavenly city, right? But go to, go to the Tortus Christus, because the church is the fullness of Christ. It means that at the end of the time, um, the whole church would be saved. And then the all members of the church can enter the heavenly city. Otherwise, in that moment, at the end of the time, Christ is still incomplete. Yeah, that's what I That's a topic Augustine did not preach about. <laughs> because in, in, in the end of his life in the Pelagian controversy, and evidently Augustine is not the canon, eh? Augustine is not dogma, eh? uh, but during the Pelagian controversy, he developed his teaching on the predestination. And Augustine at least believes that it's only a small, a small, a fixed number of the faithful that are predestined to be saved. So those that will be saved are those that will be predestined to be saved. Yeah. That's a less pastoral approach that I think in the Pelagian controversy, and I have the highest respect for Augustine, um, I, I think perhaps an error, I don't know whether we can call it an error, he was in the Pelagian controversy a mathematician. So he, he developed there a, a doctrine of grace in a very logic, almost in mathematical formulas, trying to explain in a, a logic way grace, predestination. Um, and I think when you try to explain divine grace and love with mathematical formulas, um, no, that doesn't go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, that doesn't go well. Uh, and in and, and that perspective, um, yeah, I, I would tend to disagree with Augustine. And also, you know, in Catholic doctrine, that aspect of Augustine's predestination doctrine was not accepted. But, but moderated, uh, yeah. Would, would Professor Lee also want to add some more response? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, time flies. Uh, right now is almost, uh, it's already the time to end here. Let us uh, give a big applause to, the, to Professor Dufon, uh, Professor Eric Lee, and also the panel, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, thank you for all of your coming. Yeah.